In 2018, the weight loss industry in the USA alone made $72 billion. That's the most it's ever made in its history. And while their focus is still on those old school diets that aim to drop body weight fast with calorie restriction, there's new language around dietary products like detox and cleanse, and the new dietary supplements are coming in fun shapes and sizes to try and catch more of us. Around the world, diet companies claim to use science to support their products. And what they often do is use a logical fallacy called an appeal to authority, where they lean on the reputation of the author to support their product. But when there's hardly any regulation of the products and plans being sold, there aren't really any limits to the claims the industry can make. And when I feel like there's just as many trends in the weight loss industry as the fashion industry, that's when I like to get my hands dirty and look at the science for myself. So, in this video, when I say dieting, I'm talking about a reduction of total calorie intake with the goal of losing body weight. Now, recently, the diet industry has evolved. A lot of these approaches are more nuanced. There's more of a focus on disproportionate restriction of a particular macronutrient group, which they claim is the secret to successful weight loss. But if we look at the scientific literature, we actually see that the real majority of diets fail to create weight loss that lasts. This topic got a lot of attention with the Biggest Loser study that was published in 2016. They found that although the 14 participants lost an average of 58 kilos on the show, in a follow-up they'd regained 41 kilos on average and their resting metabolic rate was 704 calories below where it was before the show had started. I just slipped back into my old habits really quick within the next year or two and within about four or five years I'd, I'd put back on all the weight. Much broader than this, three researchers from UCLA and the University of Minnesota did a review looking at all the scientific studies on weight loss diets which included a follow-up at least two years later. 21 papers met their standards and that included 60,000 subjects overall. In the follow-ups, half of the studies found no statistically significant difference in body weight between the dieting group and the control group. So it's as if the dieting group had never dieted. And across the whole 21 studies, they found that the dieters had regained everything except an average of 0.9 kilograms. Now, there's a huge network of reactions that our body has evolved over millions of years to help us or to stop us from losing weight when we go on a calorie restrictive diet. David Levitsky, a professor at Cornell University School of Human Ecology, said the body has had millions of years to develop mechanisms to resist starvation. You can't bypass them simply by going on a diet. Now, I don't know about you guys, but to me, I wouldn't call a temporary weight reduction a success. To me, success is where you can set yourself a goal and maintain it beyond that initial burst of excitement and motivation. I and the scientific studies are not saying that all diets fail at achieving long-term weight loss in every single one of us. But when there's a really strong body of research that's showing that actually there's very minimal change when people go on these diets, I think it's really important to actually talk about why these diets are failing and whether we can do something to actually create a change for good. So if you guys like this video, make sure to give me a big thumbs up and hit the subscribe button to join this amazing family. At the end of this video, I am gonna talk about what I think are the most effective options for transforming your body, but I'm only gonna to touch on them. So if you guys wanted a dedicated video of me explaining the science behind that, then if we hit 20,000 likes, I'll do it. But I just wanna make sure that I'm making content that you guys actually wanna see. So yeah, anyway, let's get straight into it. So I think a lot of us can relate to this. When we go on a diet, we just feel like our appetite goes through the roof. Nothing is ever enough. Food porn looks extra porny. Food just looks so damn good. And there's actually a lot of science that explains why that happens. So this is kind of what I wanna cover in this chapter. So there's three main hormones I wanna cover in this video. The first is leptin. So leptin is released by our fat cells, our adipocytes, and high levels of leptin signal to the brain that we are satisfied. You know, we've eaten our food and it's like, mm, I feel good. I don't need to eat anymore. 
that's what leptin does for us. Now studies have repeatedly shown that when we calorie restrict and for people who have just lost weight, our leptin levels are significantly reduced. At the end of the Biggest Loser competition, we could barely measure uh, the levels of leptin in their blood. So as a result, we have lower levels of leptin, we feel less satisfied, and so we feel like we need to eat more to actually reach that level of satisfaction. And the consequence is pretty unsurprising. A 1999 paper showed that in weight-reduced subjects, hunger scores were very good predictors of whether patients would regain that weight after a 14 month follow up. I.e. if that patient felt hungrier during and after that diet, it was a really good sign that they were probably going to regain that weight. And it's not just leptin. Ghrelin is another hormone that scientists have noticed is affected during a calorie restricted diet. So ghrelin is involved in lots of different functions in the body, but one of the most notable effects it has is on our appetite. So as ghrelin increases, we get hungrier and it stimulates our appetite. So what happens when we calorie restrict is ghrelin will increase. Now when ghrelin increases, it stimulates our appetite even more. So it's kind of having the same effect as leptin when leptin falls. When leptin falls, you don't feel as satisfied and when ghrelin increases you have a higher appetite. So leptin and ghrelin work together and what studies have shown is that even a year after losing and maintaining that weight those levels of leptin and ghrelin don't revert back to those original levels before that weight loss. Now the third hormone I wanted to talk about was cortisol. So cortisol is released when we are stressed. So it's our stress hormone. So tests in the area of neuroscience conducted studies on mice and what they did was they put mice on a calorie restricted diet and they noticed that those mice had elevated levels of cortisol. What they also noticed was that once those mice had regained that weight, they were still more sensitive to stress. They released more cortisol than mice which had never dieted before. And scientists noticed that as a result, those dieting mice with higher cortisol levels would binge. The stressful experiences made the mice crave the psychological rewards of a binge. This might help us explain why dieters report feeling anxious around food and binge eating when they've been on calorie restricted diets. When I would get really upset or depressed, I thought, well, if I could just get something really good to eat, then it'll make me feel better. And the last thing I want to cover is the general psychological response that dieters have to food. So there's a whole bunch of studies that look at the psychological effects of going on a calorie restrictive diet. And they notice that people's attention is biased towards food when they've been calorie deprived. Now this has been tested using all kinds of methods, eye tracking methods, dot probe tasks, and brain imaging studies to try and figure out how the brain responds once we've been calorie deprived. And they've all noticed that dieters have a much higher preoccupation with thoughts of food. I even noticed, and I find this one amazing, that dieters or people who are calorie deprived have a much higher sense of smell, which leads them to them being even more distracted by food. So there are all kinds of hormonal and psychological responses that make us feel hungrier, that make us feel like we can't stop thinking about food, and we can put up with those for a short amount of time. But there's not much evidence that these responses subside over time, and I think a big part of why dieters regain their weight is because it's natural to lose that motivation that initially fought against those biological responses. So the next area I want to focus on is our metabolism. So this in the energy balance equation is the energy out portion. What we were talking about before all affected the energy in portion. So the term metabolism refers to the whole range of biochemical processes that keep the body in a living state. And so total daily energy expenditure is the energy required by all of these processes in a 24 hour window. And we measure this in terms of calories or kilojoules, just like our food. So this is the calories outside of the energy balance equation and it's made up of resting metabolic rate, thermic effect of physical activity and thermic effect of food. So resting metabolic rate is the energy that we burn at complete rest. So it's the energy that's required by our organs, our tissues, everything that's going on that is not physical activity or us digesting. So imagine we were just lying in bed all day 
that sounds really nice. Not doing anything, not eating, that's how much energy we would burn. Because we still need to maintain our body temperature, the healthy functioning of our organs and tissue maintenance, and that all requires energy. And it typically makes up 55 to 80% of our total daily energy expenditure. Thermic effect of physical activity is all of the energy required for our movement. Now that can be physical activity, something that is intentional like structured exercise, or it can be non-exercise activity thermogenesis, which is non-structured exercise. So just walking up a flight of stairs, fidgeting, cleaning your home, cooking dinner, just taking steps here and there, all of that counts. And then we have the thermic effect of feeding, which is all of the energy that is required to digest process, break up, assimilate all of the food that you eat in order to acquire nutrition from it and store it. When we restrict our food intake and lower our body weight, our total daily energy expenditure also drops in order to maintain that energy balance. So let's go back to that TDE equation and look at what actually happens. So with our resting metabolic rate, it will drop. It will drop because we have less metabolically active tissue. So we have less fat, we have less muscle, and therefore our resting metabolic rate will drop. Muscle is more metabolically active than fat. So how much your resting metabolic rate decreases by depends on what you've lost. So on that hypothetical day where we're just lying in bed, not doing anything, just breathing, not even eating, we would burn less because we're at a lower weight. So next is thermic effect of physical activity. Now this will drop for three main reasons. The first is because the energy required to move a lower weight is less. The second is because if there's muscle and strength lost in that process, then you can't exert as much energy as you would have at a higher weight. And the third is because many studies have actually shown that with a weight reduction, there's a lower biological drive to actually move. So if you've lost weight, you're less likely to want to take that flight of stairs, you're less likely to want to really push yourself during a workout because you just have less drive to do it. And so in terms of thermic effect of food, if we eat less, then we're not going to be burning as much digesting or assimilating those nutrients because we just haven't eaten as much. Overall, that means that once our weight has lowered, we'll be back in energy balance and we won't continue losing any more weight. And that's where some people get caught out because I see a lot of the times people will say, oh, okay, I'm going on this two week crash diet, I'm gonna lose the weight and then I'll just go back to how I was eating before. But it doesn't work that way because your TDE will come down to put you back in energy balance. So as soon as you start eating any more, there'll be immediate weight regain. Maintaining that weight loss actually means sticking to that lower net intake for good. And that can be really hard because as we mentioned before, we have those hormonal and that psychological response that's always trying to get us back to where we were before we dieted. And if you can't keep your motivation super high, it can be really hard to keep winning that fight. In addition, there's one more thing I wanted to mention, given that we're on the topic of metabolism, and that is a concept called adaptive thermogenesis. So there are a bunch of studies that claim to have results demonstrating that your TDE lowers more than what we would expect from the reduced body weight and body composition effects that we spoke about before. So even once we adjust our TDE model for reduced muscle and fat mass effects that we've just spoken about, there's additional reductions in our energy expenditure as our bodies just become more metabolically efficient. They learn to do the same processes with less energy. And what this means if this is true is that our bodies are putting us back into a caloric surplus even if we're at a lower energy intake. In one study by Lee et al, the figure that was identified was 244 calories a day as an additional reduction in energy expenditure above what they had predicted for losses in fat and muscle mass, potentially putting them back in a caloric surplus so that they would regain weight. So to summarize, there's a downward movement of our TDE and there's an increased level of appetite and hunger, which means that both sides of our energy balance equation are trying to get us back to our original weight. So to conclude, there are a few things I wanna talk about. The first is that it's not you, it's them. It's actually really hard to stick to a diet. Our bodies have evolved through millions of years to come up with these processes so that when we do hit a moment of starvation, 
we don't die, essentially. There's a whole chain of processes that have been perfected to help us maintain our body weight. And so it's not you failing, it's not you being weak, it's what is supposed to happen based on the science. And diet brands don't tell you that. Why would they tell you that? They make you feel like it's your fault because Christina did it, she lost 40 pounds, she looks great, she feels great. And so we always blame ourselves. And so don't blame yourself because there are very real biological responses that are trying to stop that restriction. And if you do adhere to that diet and you overcome all the temptations, but your weight loss stops, again, don't blame yourself. Remember that your energy expenditure has gone down to put you back in energy balance. The products we're sold are constantly changing. I know sometimes we laugh about diets that existed like five, 10 years ago, but it's always happening and we're always like this time, this time we got it. But science doesn't move that quickly. It's just important to remember that and scientists are still learning and it's a slow process. It doesn't happen in trends. Now the second thing I wanna talk about, despite everything I've mentioned before in this video, is that change isn't impossible. I think we just need to look at it differently. The studies we've looked at tend to be applying methods that are very calorie restrictive to get quick, weight loss results and that's probably because there are funding restrictions and they need to produce data quickly and i guess if you think about it that's kind of a lot like common diet culture how many times have we read headlines that say i lost eight pounds in seven days or celebrating the biggest loser because they lost weight really really quickly we've developed this whole culture around speed and i think that's a big part of the puzzle maybe our bodies are protecting us from starvation because a lot of the diets that we put ourselves on are essentially like starvation. I would love to see a larger body of high quality research where subjects are allowed to take their time. Then what would their hormone profile look like? And would adaptive thermogenesis happen? One study compared a slow weight loss approach to a rapid weight loss approach, where both groups lost the same amount of weight over a different period of time. One result was that the rapid weight loss groups were an even bigger fall in their resting metabolic rate than the slow weight loss group. On top of that, the slow weight loss group lost only half a kilo of lean body mass, which is that metabolically active tissue that we want, while that rapid weight loss group lost three times that amount. In terms of actual fat loss, the slow weight loss group lost 4.5 out of six kilos of weight due to fat, while the rapid weight loss group lost 2.9 out of the six kilos due to fat. This suggests that not all weight loss is equal and the speed at which we do it could be a really key factor in that. The next thing is that I think proper education around nutrition is really important. There was a Stanford test where they had 600 subjects all wanting to lose weight. Half of them were on a low carb diet and half of them were on a low fat diet and they weren't restricting. They weren't calorie counting, none of that. Now what was really interesting was that all of them had 22 classes of food nutrition advice from registered dietitians to educate them around food. At the end of the year, both groups individually had lost an average of five and a half kilos. It showed that the low carb, low fat didn't make any difference and their education around food and the emphasis on whole foods transform their body. And the last thing I want to talk about is body recomposition. Like I mentioned before, not all weight loss is equal and I think weight itself is a pretty vague indicator. I think there's a conversation about body recomposition that we should be having. Not obsessing about weight so much but realizing that at the same body weight two bodies can look entirely different and they can have completely different metabolic requirements based on the percentage of fat versus muscle that they have. There's a solid body of scientific evidence evidence that shows that body recomposition is possible. Body recomposition being that you can lose fat and build muscle at the same time. And that can totally transform the way your body looks. And I think this could be an amazing route for us to consider. This is personally what I've done over the last few years, but I also see it a lot in professional athletes who have just come back from injury. Their weight might not necessarily have changed, but their composition will have changed. So they'll have put on a little bit more fat, lost a little bit of muscle since they haven't been able to exercise due to injury. And once they can get back to exercising, they can build that muscle, lose that fat. Again, their weight doesn't change, but their overall health and metabolic requirements and how they look 
totally changes. And I'll be honest, it takes a much more informed approach. It's not as simple as just cutting calories or cutting out a certain macro. And maybe that makes it harder to sell for the diet industry, even though the science is there. But like I said, if you guys want a video about it, we'll hit that 20,000 likes and I'll go ahead and make it. But until then, I hope you enjoyed this video and please give me a big thumbs up if you did. Hit the subscribe button if you want to see more videos. I will see you guys very soon. Love ya. Bye.